I'm Nidhi Kumar and welcome to the program today at India Science. Today we make an honest endeavor to develop the scientific temper of our society. With the current COVID-19 pandemic rapidly spreading, even now, thus intensifying its impact upon the world healthcare systems, it gives me immense pleasure today to welcome Amit Sas, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is currently the Chief Scientist at the World Health Organization since March 2019. And prior to this, she was also the Director General at the ICMR, Indian Council for Medical Research. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you for joining us. Also joining us today is uh, Professor Virinda Singh Chauhan, who's a visionary scientist, a Rhodes Scholar. He's currently the Chairman of the EC of the NAAC. And for his scientific and human resource development, he was awarded the Padma Shri by the GOI in 2012. Welcome you, sir. My first question to you, ma'am, is uh, your role as chief scientist in WHO. The focus areas really as uh, India tries to battle uh, the pandemic and so does the world. Thank you very much, Nidhi, and greetings to all our uh, the viewers. I think this is a very unique position and I'm very honored to be the first chief scientist of WHO. As you know, this position was created in March of 2019. And looking back, you can say that maybe this was the right time for WHO to have created this function. The science division was set up basically to be uh, visionary, forward thinking, and um, be ahead of the curve in terms of developments in science and technology. We all know that technological advances can bring huge benefits to humanity. And particularly here, of course, we are concerned with health of people. So, we know that you know, advances in, in computing and in artificial intelligence and in data science in genomics, all of this can bring big benefits to both clinical care and public health. But at the same time, there's always a downside. There's always a risk for any new technology. And so it's important to be able to look at it in perspective, consider the ethical and social and legal implications of some of these advances. So that's one of the functions of the science division. Um, the other one is really to bring a lot of scientific discipline and rigor into the development of what we call norms and standards. You know, WHO is a normative agency. We make guidelines, we set standards, we collect data. The, a large part of the world depends on guidance from WHO. So it's really important for us to have the best possible methodology as well as the most rigor in developing these guidelines. So they have to be not only scientifically excellent, but they also need to be relevant, they need to be timely, they need to be responsive to the end user needs, and they need to be developed in a format which is easily accessible and usable. We have to move away from the old 20th century paper books and PDFs to a new way of doing things in the digital world. So these are the key areas that we are trying to develop. There's also research and how we can promote and facilitate research on, on the priorities uh, that we see around us, especially those priorities which are neglected by the private sector, and by the market forces. So that's very briefly the, the kind of functions that we have. But I want to now ask you a very specific question. If we talk about COVID nationalism, do you see it starting soon? And uh, how do you ensure at the WHO that you uh, procure the vaccine to less advanced countries, less developed countries, who may not be having the price to pay? Or And how do you deal with efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Yes, I mean, I think the WHO is in a unique position, you know, because we are made up of 194 member states and we have very strong convening power. That's one of our strengths is to bring people around the table and to talk to them. So very early on in this pandemic, we started talking about the role of science and the role of research. And what I have seen is unprecedented levels of collaboration of willingness to work together, especially among scientists and researchers and medical doctors, willingness to share uh, and be quite open about uh, their findings. Even before things are published, they are shared with us so because they know it helps the public health response. And we knew that the, the solutions for this pandemic are going to come from science, whether it's understanding the virus and how it transmits, whether it's understanding how to develop you know, better prevention strategies, new drugs, new vaccines, new diagnostics. All of that needs global collaboration, particularly bringing together countries as well as private and public sector. 
so i ha i have as i have been quite optimistic and quite encouraged by the response so far as far as nationalism is concerned i think it's but natural that every country every political leader will look to protect their own populations will try to do as much as possible for their own populations so we can't be critical about that what we have to see is how can political leaders make sure they are doing things for their own population but at the same time not forgetting their neighbors not forgetting the world because for the pandemic we know the virus doesn't know any borders you know the virus is going to keep on circulating around the world so there's no point having islands where people are protected so that's really i think a very strong argument for why a global approach is needed and why a nationalistic approach is not going to work so ma'am just told us about uh, you know the vaccine and how uh, who is taking all kind of uh, measures to procure it and so also about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine would you like to add to that to begin with uh, a lot of people have question in general public how come there are diseases like hiv and malaria and whole lot of diseases are known for some more than 100 years back and we don't have vaccine and when we talk about covid vaccine there are more than 200 candidates which are under trial so uh, is it that the covid vaccine uh, preparation is easier than other vaccines so these are general questions uh, this is true that there are more than 250 now maybe more than 300 vaccine candidates are in preparation uh, at least about 35 have gone through safety trials and at least 10 are in advanced stage of phase 3 trial now this has happened at a spectacular pace never before in the history of any vaccine production so one wonders and the public rightly wonders what is happening so uh, if i just take a, a very brief uh, minute on this vaccines are produced against pathogens all kinds whether viruses or bacteria or or parasites by introducing a part of a full pathogen itself sure. so for example as you know polio vaccine has oral vaccine injectable vaccine earlier vaccines would have killed virus what happens then the human immune system is highly advanced is very advanced that anything that foreign which appear enters the body the body immediately mounts a response and uh, without going into the detail there are two arms of human immune responses one which produces antibodies and another called cellular responses and in most cases both are are produced antibodies are really like soldiers so when the virus comes the next time around if the antibodies are they go and grab hold of the of the virus or the pathogen and and kills it or neutralizes it in the case of covid which is sars covid virus 2 the sars 1 which had appeared in 2003 2001 2003 the whole genomic information was available as somya said earlier that the the tools molecular biology tools the scientific tools are so well advanced that the moment a new virus will show up you will be able to grow it in lab or sequences in absolutely no time so if this kind of virus had happened let's say 50 years back developing an rt pcr would have taken you months or even six months yeah yeah but here on 16th of january 11th of january genome sequence was shared by chinese and some was absolutely right the scientific collaboration that we saw this time around with covid is just unimaginable collaboration so moment it was shared and in no time people found unique sequences uh, on the uh, covid 2 uh, on the uh, the sars 2 which was not there in sars 1 so therefore you could differentiate between sars 1 and sars 2 so let me go back to vaccine the sars 1 information was very useful and you just align the genome of sars 1 and sars 2 and you immediately know which is the functional portion so it's not surprising within two months you had the first vaccine not only developed oh. or made but actually entered into humans so in this case this is a special you, you might say the word in some sense of prepared if such a virus a corona virus would come now what i wanted to add for the common knowledge that 
vaccines can be produced by many methods. So you kill the virus, you can, uh, so you said RNA viruses, you can take a piece of RNA, there are DNA vaccines. These are in research mode vaccines. So actually the first vaccine which went into humans, there is no RNA platform based vaccine which has yet received approval for any other disease. But the science of RNA and DNA vaccines have moved. I don't want to make this answer very long for you, except for to say that any platform for vaccine development that could be used has been used for COVID-19. But the public would be very happy to know that the 10 vaccines which have gone forward for phase three, many of them are made on different platforms. So success of one or two or three is much more possible compared to if they were all if they were all on the same platform. So we have an RNA vaccine. We have a Oxford vaccine is is through uh, uh, through a through a non-infective virus. Same for China, and then there is a vaccine which is based on protein. But let me quickly come to the genetic engineering and molecular biology allows you to look at portions of viruses or pathogens which you may call business end of the virus. As I said, the S protein in this case, most vaccines that we are now working on uh, for COVID-19 are focusing to create antibodies against the S protein. It's called spike protein. So vaccines, since vaccines are going to be given to a very large population, who can argue almost everybody on this earth will have to be immunized. So the safety in the mind of scientists, developer, manufacturer, government, is of paramount interest. And I think public, we have to convince and hammer into the public, the public's mind that safety, efficacy is one thing. Suppose the vaccine is efficacious, but also harmful. It is of no value, that vaccine. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, that people have been asking very recently about the many mutations of COVID-19 virus. Uh, of the RNA virus, ma'am, if I'm right, how is this going to impact uh, vaccine development? And also the trial, the dash 614G, how could we relate this to epidemiology? Well, Dr. Chauhan is an expert uh, on genomics. He will give his views. But uh, one, again, very good thing we've seen is the open sharing of the genomic sequence data. In fact, today is a milestone. 100,000 full genome sequences have been shared with GISAID, just of this new virus in the last eight months from over 70 countries, including India. So scientists have been depositing the whole genome sequences in this database called GISAID, which was originally set up for influenza, which is now expanding to other pathogens. And what it does is it gives scientists around the world uh, an opportunity to be studying this virus very closely. You mentioned the D614G mutation. There are other mutations as well. This mutation was more interesting because people felt that it might be increasing the transmissibility, increasing the infectivity of this virus. However, what we've seen from epidemiology doesn't seem to show that it has mutated to become worse or anything like that. So far, there are no clear correlations between mutations and the, uh, and the clinical profile of, of the virus. It's also important for us to keep track because we know that most of the vaccines today are being developed against the spike protein, the S protein. And so if there is a, a major mutation in that, in that protein, it's possible that these vaccines may not be so effective. So far, again, we've been lucky. Uh, it, there hasn't been. And overall, the rate of mutations uh, is much less than, say, for a virus like influenza. So uh, lots of lessons being learned. For the first time, I think it has uh, been possible to see so much of genetic sequence data in such a short period of time. So again, this is a big win for science. And it's because now we have much more capacity, even in uh, Africa, even in the smallest countries, to be able to do this. It's become much easier. And I think I wish and I hope that this will continue for other diseases, the same kind of global collaboration. Yes, ma'am. Um, the trial stopped very recently. Could you tell us know why? So after the phase one, you must have heard all these vaccines pass through safety trial in the phase. Phase one is a small number, 50 to 60 adults. And, and generally it was safe, some small bits, but more you safe. The phase two or phase three, which are allowed to be merged in this, have a very large number. What you do in such trials, you take, let's say, X number 
let's say 1,000 people are to be in. Actually, the number is much larger. But just to for understanding, let's say the 1,000 people you want to do a phase three trial. 500 of the 1,000 will receive the vaccine on the trial in the dosage. 500 will not receive the vaccine, but just get what is called placebo and any inject, but there'll be an injection. So nobody gets to know who has vac vaccine and who does not get vaccine. There's a monitoring committee, which is completely different from people who manufacture or people who make the vaccine or your scientists. Scientists have no idea. They are out of it after development, after manufacture, they cannot play. Then you follow these thousands, all thousands, because you don't know which one has placebo, which one has a vaccine. In the case of Moderna, in the case of uh, Oxford vaccine recently, AstraZeneca vaccine, one individual in England showed uh, an event which is uh, will be considered unsafe. But remember, nobody knew that whether it is placebo person or is a vaccine person. So right at the outset, one cannot say it was a vaccine induced, but people who were doing trials would know. So immediately trials were and these are standard mechanisms. I just want to hammer this point. All of us who are in, I mean, in my own lab for malaria, we have done two phase one trials. The extreme caution is taken that nothing toxic enters human body. But anyway, coming back very quickly to this, the, the, then they, you have to follow. The event that has happened is because of vaccine or not because of it. In this case, this was very quickly resolved, but resolution is not done by you, me, or, or people who develop. It has to be done by independent team. It's called safe data safety management board. Each vaccine has to have it. And very quickly they found out that the individual who had the adversary, uh, the individual who had, had nothing to do with vaccination. So therefore the trials were restarted. Same Moderna trials, uh, same Oxford uh, trial have been again restarted. So that's very good news the vaccination but point is this that even a slight suspicion that the vaccine is is is, is unsafe uh, is, is very good news that the public gets to know that if and when vaccine comes it will be entirely safety will be the major issue absolutely um do you think people are now becoming complacent now that the lockdowns have been lifted what is your advice to the general public if you look at india we've seen a lot of this you know uh, people are not so, you know, um, guarded anymore, if that's the right word. Yes, because people have been through a very hard time for the last several months all over the world. And I think it has uh, impacted particularly those uh, who have been more, who are poor, who are more vulnerable, who have less uh, of a reserve, you know, to fall back on. So we really need to remember that this pandemic has actually brought out a lot of inequalities in our societies all over the world, we've seen this. Now, as time has passed, countries have had to open up their economies, which means people are back again at work, they're gathering together, they're meeting, they're going you know, by public transport, they've also started socializing. And this has resulted in an increase in the number of infections in any country which has opened up, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Latin America, or in Asia and in India that we're seeing. So I think a few things we have to remember as we go forward, and we can't win this unless citizens and government work together. The first thing is to avoid those situations which we know increase the risk of transmission. Gatherings, big gatherings, whether they are religious gatherings or sports or cultural events, where a lot of people gather together, especially in closed environments. That's a high risk we, we have to be in. Where there are offices or educational institutions, they need to be very clear SOPs put in place for how people must adhere to certain uh, precautions and rules, and those must be enforced. The second is that um, we need to protect those who are most vulnerable. So, you know, the elderly, those who have underlying illnesses, we know that they are at higher risk of getting ill. And therefore, it is a responsibility of younger people to protect those who are older in their families and not expose them unnecessarily to the risk of infection. Thirdly, we have to empower citizens to people really need to take responsibility for their own actions and not leave it to someone else. So if you wear a mask when you're going out, you're protecting yourself and protecting others as well. So if every person does that, there's been some modeling to show that if 95% of the world was wearing a mask all the time, 
you could dramatically reduce the mortality rate and as well as the infection rate. Um, and then finally, of course, we need to focus on where the infection is. We cannot give up on trying to locate, trying to diagnose and isolate those people because if you don't do that, infectious people are going to be spreading it to others. So increasing testing, making sure that they get isolated, tracking the contacts, quarantining them, making sure that hospitals are equipped to take care of. We are going to see increasing burden of sick people because as infections increase, you will have increasing hospitalizations as well. So we need to be prepared to, we've made a lot of advances in the last few months on how to manage. That's why we see the mortality rates going down. So we need to try and keep the death rate low by making sure that doctors and nurses are, you know, have the latest information and as well as the equipments to manage those who become sick. So it's really a, a very all of society, all of government kind of approach that we need now. Children, if we talk specifically of them, 1.6 billion uh, students out of school. Uh, education needs to go on, I'm sure you'll agree. So how does it affect the children even on a social and cognitive uh, level? And how do you think uh, we should respond to this? So the, we are, as you, you can say, we are really in the middle of it. This is in everybody's mind. And people have already reported, children have reported, that needless to say, it will have an effect. It will affect on all of us. It's having having effect on all of us. So you can't just shy off that nothing will happen. Those uh, who are fortunate enough to have access to school, friends through social media, their impact will, of course, will be less. But there are large number of people, and I dare say in all countries. It's, of course, in developing country. And poor country, this number will be proportion will be much larger. But even in the best of the most developed country, children by by the nature of being children actually want to go out, talk to their friends, and suddenly out of nowhere, that's not allowed. So if, you, if you see in Europe, most most countries have opened their schools, so they are beginning to start whether they can play soccer or not, and and what. Somya would say, uh, and I, I would say, that COVID-19 will teach us going forward. We'll go maybe three steps forward. We might have to take a step back. And I don't think anybody should worry about it. Oh, yesterday you said this, today you are saying it. But that's the nature of this pandemic. We mustn't worry about going back. So we open schools slowly. And if we find that the spike is unhealthy, then go back slowly. And there, there should be no worry about it. Some countries are imposing a second lockdown, uh, as we speak, Israel has done so. And how do you think uh, India's, uh, you know, uh, policy on health is, do we need to invest more on health? So, I, as I said, the COVID, unfortunately, this, everybody's called unprecedented, I think is way beyond unprecedented. We haven't seen anything as infectious as this in, in our generation and the previous generation. Mm -hmm. uh, it will teach us. So we know we can do social distancing, we know we can wear a mask, and yet there could be infections. So uh, I don't think there is any panic we, if we have to re... There are areas that have to be... New Zealand has done so yesterday. Yeah. Indonesia has done it day before. So I, I, this is the way to go forward. Open, because people have to earn, people have to eat, people have to go. And if you can be caught me as well, yes. The second wave come. Third wave comes, I think we respond to waves without fear, but with a lot of respect for the virus. Absolutely. And on that note, uh, I think we'll uh, end uh, today's conversation. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Soumya and uh, Dr. Virendra Ji, for joining us and sharing this insightful information with us. We wish My you pleasure. the very best for your future endeavors. And to all our viewers, uh, let us today celebrate science and kudos to the medical fraternity and the scientific fraternity for helping us tide over this pandemic. On that note, many thanks for watching. Keep watching India Science.